Hello. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. hello, everyone. I hope hello, you are people. Hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. I hope you are fine and healthy. Today, we have another special edition of our PTT Talk by Petrochronics. The Petrochronics Actions includes a Brazil based research group and an international network of collaborators who are focused on the investigation and scientific dissemination of petrochronological techniques and their implications for our understanding of the geodynamic evolution of our planet and Earth systems. If you are a petrology and geodynamic enthusiast, uh, please feel free to follow us on our social media and find out more. Today, together with Professor Maria Tedeschi from Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, Professor Brenda Rocha from Universidade de São Paulo, Mariana Madeira and Hugo, we are honored to announce our speaker, Dr. Silvia Volante from Universitet. So, welcome, Silvia. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to give a brief introduction about Silvia. So Silvia Volante, she completed her uh, bachelor and master's studies at the University of Milan in Italy. During her master, she carried out a field-based field thesis project on the tectonometamorphic evolution of the Argentera Mercantur Massif, one of the external massifs of the Western Alps, which encompasses relics of a very scanned suture zone. So in September 2016, she joined uh, Professor Zheng Xiang Li's Earth Dynamics Research Group at Curtin University in Perth in Western Australia to start a field-based PhD project that investigated the tectonic evolution of Northern Queensland uh, during the Paleo and Mesoproterozoic in order to better understand the role of uh, Northeastern Australia during the evolution of the Precambrian uh, supercontinent Nuna, Colombia. Uh, she received her PhD in December 2020. And since May 2020, Sylvia is a junior researcher at the Ruhr University uh, in the Tectonic Resor uh, and Resources Research Group in Germany. Uh, Sylvia's current research focuses on understanding early Earth processes in Archean uh, terrains by applying a multidisciplinary approach which combines metamorphic and igneous petrology with geochemistry and geochronology. So thank you, Sylvia. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. And now we are looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Brenda, for this a nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia, it's really nice to have you. You are also a collaborator on Petrochronic since the beginning. And uh, it's really nice that you will add also some deformation to our PTT talk, PTT test. And Sylvia, today she will present the talk uh, Laurentia in Australia Structural, Metamorphic, and Mag Magmatic Evolution of the Georgetown in Lyre, Northeast Australia during Nuna Columbia. So thank you, Sylvia, and make yourself All right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you, guys. That was a, a very uh, nice introduction. Um, so yeah, as, uh, as you already uh, nicely introduced the title of my talk, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, and uh, so this is uh, basically what I've been uh, doing for my PhD. Um, and are the main results uh, that came out of it, uh, which was anyway a project that involved uh, different researchers from um, different universities as well. Um, so I will jump into the first slide, uh, where basically, um, so this is uh, um, the timeline uh, going to up to present. And um, this is just like, um, synthesis, let's say, uh, of what we know today of the main supercontinents uh, throughout the geological history. Um, more constraints are available for the most recent supercontinent, Pangaea, and good constraints have been combined also for um, the supercontinent, Rodinia. But less is known uh, about the geological record during um, and recorded uh, uh, during the oldest supercontinent, uh, Nuna or Columbia. 
uh, I will refer to it as Nuna, so I don't have to say both names uh, throughout the talk. Um, so for this reason, in the last uh, um, decades, has been done a lot of, uh, um, has been put a lot of effort um, to advance the understanding of this older supercontinent existing configuration and evolution by ex expanding not only the uh, paleomagnetic uh, record, but also the geological records to improve the paleotectonic models um, of this ancient supercontinent. So in this talk, I will focus on the oldest supercontinent, Nuna, uh, in particular. Um, and if we have a look um, at uh, just some of the most recent paleotectonic models um, for Nuna between uh, 1.65 and 1.5 uh, bi uh, billion years, um, I will, uh, the main focus was actually understanding how Northeast Australia uh, was involved um, in, uh, in Nuna uh, configuration during the Proterozoic. And so this model all feature a connection between Northeast Australia and North uh, West Laurentia. Um, and um, all uh, suggest that Nuna, that uh, Australia was actually in the core of the supercontinent Nuna during uh, pro the, the Proterozoic configuration. So, but uh, if we zoom in, uh, in Northeast Australia, uh, we and we have a look at the um, edge of the North, Aus uh, uh, the North uh, Australian Craton. Uh, we uh, can identify uh, five main Proterozoic in layer, um, which are now part of the North Australian Craton and are edged by the Tasman Line. In particular, in the western, we have the Mount Isa in layer, and then uh, to the east, the Georgetown in layer, and some. Um, northern in layer up here. So, um, in particular, uh, I will focus on understanding the evolution of the Georgetown in layer within uh, this regional context. Um, not only because it has a very good had a, has a very good exposures of Precambrian rocks um, in the, in this part of the world, but also because its tectonic and metamorphic and magmatic evolutions um, haven't been uh, um, really uh, very well constrained within the, reg the regional, but also the uh, Nuna um, uh, context during Proterozoic. Um, and here um, I show uh, some of the uh, work that have been done from, uh, from our group um, that suggested that the Georgetown in layer, which is here represented by the color green and throughout the slide by the color green, um, uh, the, 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 all the sedimentary rocks uh, that, uh, um, that uh, are part of the Georgetown in layer were actually sourced from the Laurentian block. Um, and then uh, additionally, uh, Garnet geochronology and thermodynamic modeling uh, uh, documented simultaneous metamorphic evolution between the Montaiza in layer in purple, um, which is the Western in layer, and uh, the Georgetown in layer here in green. Um, at 1.60 billion years, corresponding to the upper and the lower plate, respectively. Those, uh, basically, these, uh, these studies uh, argue that the Georgetown in layer uh, was part of Laurentia originally, and then accreted at 1.60 billion years towards uh, the North Australian Kraton, um, reflecting the um, timing of the assembly of the supercontinent Nuna in this part of the world. Okay, so um, so in this talk, as I mentioned, I will present um, well, the work that I've, we, we have been doing to test the, uh, this hypothesis, this link between um, between um, Montaiza and the Georgetown in Lyre, um, and the fact that uh, they um, um, uh, they uh, collided at 1.60 billion years. Um, and so, and, uh, and uh, in order to understand the evolution of this Procambrian crust, we investigated the orogenic record, architect, and the processes associated with this orogenic system. Uh, and um, on top of that, we also tried to evaluate and, uh, to, and locate uh, the suture associated to this uh, collisional event. So let's have a look at the Georgetown in Lyre. Uh, I will briefly introduce the geology um, of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, Proterozoic um, 
terrain, uh, and this, uh, which is formed by uh, a polyprothrozoic sedimentary sequence that you can see uh, here in uh, lighter and, dark, uh, and darker blue, um, that is con almost continuously preserved from the, from the upper sequence here in the west to uh, the lower sequence in the southeast. Um, only the lower sequence was uh, uh, intruded uh, at uh, 1.65 uh, billion years by mafic seals, dikes, and associated with extrusive pillow lava. These rocks were then deformed at 1.6 billion years and metamorphosed, and then were successively uh, intruded by 1.55 felsic uh, plutons associated with extrusive volcanic rocks which kept the sequence here in the West, represented by this very weak uh, um, light uh, uh, pink. Um, so during our work, we identified three main domains, uh, uh, in particular um, metamorphic domains that I will refer to throughout the talk. So I'm going to introduce you uh, first to the Western domain um, uh, in this part of the world where um, basically uh, is uh, composed by low-grade green schist, fascist, philitic rocks, where the sedimentary structure are still preserved. Uh, the central domain, which local, locally preserves uh, garnet starolite schist, but silimanite bearing schist um, associated with sink kinematic granites are dominant. And the eastern domain, uh, which is uh, a magmatitic complex characterized by extens uh, uh, extensive partial melting. So uh, this layer therefore reflects uh, a crossal section of a mesoprotozoic orogenic belt, uh, which uh, was uh, um, interpreted uh, to record a continuous metamorphic uh, um, gradient and therefore was interpreted as single tectono, met tectono uh, metamorphic units. Hopefully by the end of the talk, uh, um, we will, I will convince you that um, it's not that simple. Um, all right, so um, we'll start with the first deformation metamorphic event that we identified in the Western domain. So um, this uh, uh, um, identified by this uh, greener uh, um, top color. So uh, regional mapping in particular in this area has allowed the identification of the original orientation of uh, the 1.60 uh, D1 structure to be determined as north, northeast striking. And here are represented in blue. And you can see them better also here in this crux section and in the sterinets. The geometry of this F1 falls as uprightly, slightly inclined, and the steepness of, this, of the associated actual planar fabric uh, indicate that this structure developed uh, as compressive, uh, as uh, under compressive tectonic regime, um, with the dominant uh, um, west-northwest, uh, um, west-northwest shortening direction. Locally, the uh, north and northeast uh, um, striking as one fabric preserve uh, intrafoliation isoclinal folds that suggest um, that um, is a more complex fabric that um, this fabric has a more complex nature than um, what um, uh, than, this, um, than the way it looks like a, as a simple cleavage. Uh, the regional orientation of this uh, D1 structure are progressively uh, reoriented southwards, so um, going towards the central, the central part by successive D2 and D3 deformation events. And in this um, southern part, the D1 orientation uh, is completely obliterated. If we look at um, this structure at the micro scale, uh, the S1 fabric is defined by green schist fascist mineral assemblages um, in this Western domain, which suggests that the development of this D1 structure occurred at shallow crustal levels during the 1.60 D1 event. Um, locally, only in the vicinity of this pluton in the central domains, um, S1 is statically overgrown by these uh, randomly oriented andalusite porphyroblast. If we move to the central domain, um, in this in in this uh, in this area, um, 
uh, in this area, uh, D1 relics are preserved. Um, uh, and in particular, in the, in the Western, in the Western uh, uh, part of, um, if you go in a uh, West-East uh, um, transit, uh, in this Western part, um, we still see, um, we still uh, um, can see the sedimentary structures, but then, uh, which is similar to what we saw in here in the Western domain. And then uh, going towards the central parts, the S1 uh, fabric is a complex, um, foliation uh, in uh, that um, that form nice SC structure within garnet and starolite schist. Uh, additionally, it is associated with um, a mineral lineation that feature a bimod bimodal orientation, which might might reflect uh, two sets of D1 linear structures associated with the composite nature of this fabric or might represent the effect of subsequent deformation event, possibly D2, um, which also developed uh, a north-south uh, north striking structure, but is associated to uh, extension. Uh, if we have a look at S1 foliation at the micro, at the micro, at the micro scale, um, it is defined by an S1 and A and an S1 B progressive foliation that developed within the garnet and starlight stability field. So in this microstructural sketch, um, you can see the S1 fabric within a D2 low strain domain. So where uh, it is uh, nicely preserved. And it's within this context that uh, we precisely dated the CS1 uh, garnet with lutetium alpha geochronology and corroborated these dates with uh, monazite geochronology, um, which both gave an age of 1600 uh, million years for the um, development of S1 fabric. Also, garnet relics are, par uh, are uh, preserved within uh, D2 domains where, the, where they are wrapped by the S2 uh, silimanite defining foliation. Um, and S1 is only preserved as the um, inclusion trails within the garnet. Uh, however, also this garnet yielded 1600 million years um, after uh, lutetium afrin geochronology. Additionally, as uh, you can notice that major and trace, uh, major and trace element uh, for uh, both garnets uh, show differences. So uh, within uh, D2 low strain domains, the garnet preserved um, in major and trace element uh, its uh, original composition, uh, where that, whereas in the D2 domains, um, this is partially, partially re reset. Um, also, mineral chemistry from the biotite uh, shows variability in its composition from S1 in yellow to S2 in uh, red, where you can see uh, an increase in titanium content uh, reflecting an increase in temperature um, of the um, overprinting uh, 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 higher grade S2 foliation. Um, so basic, so um, uh, by uh, uh, by combining the observation and the geochronology dates uh, for reconstructing the D1 and 1 event, uh, pressure, temperature, deformation, and uh, time path uh, for the central domain uh, suggests that the D1 and 1 event occurred um, at about eight kilobar and um, six, 600, 600, uh, 650 degrees. Um, in, uh, and, and that was uh, um, corroborated by both the uh, sample in the low strain domain and in the um, D2 um, higher strain domain. Um, in the center, in the eastern domain, instead, no D1 and, and M1 um, records were identified. So we move to the second deformation and metamorphic event, starting from the uh, western domain. Um, where, however, we say that that is uh, very uh, partially um, rec uh, very partially recorded this event only uh, in the vicinity of this pluton from the central domain where we have this uh, andalusite uh, um, grains. But west of this uh, of the western domain, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have the uh, volcanic rocks that cap the sequence here in the west, uh, associated with um, Subvolcanic granites that are here uh, colored in uh, different uh, uh, different purple. So if we have a look at those um, rocks, 
Uh, the non-foliated volcanics have a perforated texture, while the subvolcanic granites are general uh, mega crystal garnet biotite bearing, uh, commonly def uh, undeformed or weakly deformed, uh, and they um, uh, commonly host mafic enclaves uh, such as the one you can see uh, here. Uh, and more importantly, they intruded uh, uh, low-grade made sedimentary rocks of the upper crustal western domain. Both uh, monazite uh, and zircon shrimp were in a geochronology yielded age of 1550 million years for uh, the subvolcanic rocks and uh, sorry the volcanic rocks and the subvolcanic rocks um, uh, associated. So. To, in order to understand the uh, petrogenesis uh, of the granites that intruded the hole in layer, um, uh, we also um, we also uh, did some um, geochemistry uh, and uh, uh, compared it with um, some uh, modeled melt uh, after uh, partially melting an average metapolitic composition from the central domain which um, was uh, assumed to be a good candidate as a protolith for these granites. And, and we will go back to that. But what I want to show you here is that uh, the influence of garnet uh, uh, and uh, biotite uh, uh, retention in the males is uh, uh, very well shown for the Western uh, domain, uh, which is reflected by the green symbols in all the, um, in all the graphs. Um, with, uh, with the granite, the, the granites, these Western granites that project from the melt composition, which are down here, to, um, towards both gran garnet and biotite up here. Uh, additionally, the uh, green symbols plot on the top array uh, towards the garnet um, in this uh, iron plot and in the bottom of the array. Uh, still towards the garnet uh, in this uh, magnesium uh, uh, plot, which demonstrate a more substantial influence uh, of the recitic garnet retention in the uh, Western granites uh, relative to, for, in, for example, um, the, the red dots, which are the Eastern domain. Um, something to mention as well is uh, the calcium, which is uh, um, quite low in the Western uh, granites compared to the central, uh, to, from, to the granite from the central uh, region here in, uh, in purple. Um, additionally, uh, the zirconium content in these granites is quite high, which reflect temperature between 800 and 850 degrees for these volcanic and subvolcanic rocks from the Western domain. All right, then, if we look at the um, adjacent central domain, the transition uh, from D1 uh, to the D2 structural overprint uh, is best preserved in this area, where you can see uh, from this uh, cross section as well that the uh, shallow foliation that is uh, preserved within uh, the schist uh, in this um, in, in this transition, crosscut at high angle the D1 structures, and uh, in this uh, in this transition, S2 become more pervasive and progressively more organizing going eastward, whereas associated with increased um, sink kinematic granitic intrusion and migmatization of the metasedimentary host tracks. Um, this S2 uh, foliation is a complex high-grade um, foliation that is actual planar fabric of these recumbent uh, isoclinals of two folds uh, and is also uh, associated with an east-southeast mirror lineation. The progressive development of this complex S2 fabric occurred under partial melting and continuous uh, melt segregation. So uh, there are very, um, it's a very heterogeneous and there are um, uh, high strain uh, high strain domains, um, high strain domains, um, and locally low strains D2 domains. If we look at the micro scale, uh, in this point um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, the, um, the foliation that you measure in the field is a shallow west dipping foliation, which is um, this, this foliation here. And only in low strain domain, you can see uh, S1 relics of the of the previous foliation. 
But then uh, in other location, uh, the ester foliation preserved all their records, mainly in hold finches, which are lower strain zones, um, such as, for instance, in this location, uh, where you have S1 um, relics uh, that are uh, in microlitans of the um, first stage of the S2 foliation that is defined by andalusite, or also in this case that I showed already earlier, where S1 is only preserved as inclusion trails uh, in garnet that is wrapped by a silimanite defining S2 foliation. Um, so in this, um, in this context, we um, dated monazite uh, associated with uh, S, uh, two, S, S, the S2 fabric, so S2A and S2B. And uh, in both cases, it yielded an age of 1550 million years, uh, overprinting the 1600 S1 foliation. So going back to um, the PTDT path, um, what we can we can add this part of the story and 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 um, in particular how S1 was overprinted uh, by uh, andalusite uh, at uh, uh, lower pressure um, and mid temperature and then andalusite was overprinted by uh, silimanite um, during the same event uh, during the same event at 1550 million years. So if we have a look at the granites from the central domain, which are all these orange and pinkish uh, colors over here, these granites are variably foliated and um, are generally uh, enclosed as sheets uh, within, um, within the metasedimentary uh, rocks. The foliation in the granites uh, samples is generally defined by align alignment of recrystallized biotite, muscovite quartz, um, and as you can see also here, also as uh, biotite uh, uh, restitic cloth that are aligned uh, to S2. Also in this case, shrimp perennial ledger chronology using zircon, zircon and monazite uh, gave an age of 1550 million years, so um, synchronous to not only the S2 fabric, uh, but also the granites in the Western domain. Um, so the phase, uh, phase equilibrium calculation were conducted, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to understand the petrogenesis, petrogenesis of these um, pearluminous granites and to understand uh, how, uh, which role the water played um, within hydrous crust in terms of melt production. So we partially melting uh, the average um, metapolitic rocks from the central domain, which produces these um, primary melts that are down here as stars um, that coincide with high silica uh, end of the George, uh, George of the of this array, which are all the granites from the Georgetown in Lyre, um, and generally overlap in magnesium content. Uh, indeed, what we can see is that uh, cal the calcium is uh, quite uh, uh, various and supports the presence of uh, residual plagioclase um, in the, um, as the, G as the, these granites lie on a tie line between these primary melts and the residual uh, plagioclase. Also in this case, um, we, we, we met, we, uh, compare, uh, we used the zirconium content. And what we can see is that uh, is um, is quite lower compared to uh, the western um, in green, but also the red, uh, which are the eastern domain, uh, and that reflect indeed um, a, a lower temperature uh, using zircon and monazite thermometry about uh, 700 to 750 degree, so lower compared to the western domain. Uh, by using a TX diagram, we also demonstrated that the minimum saturation point, which is uh, here represented by this yellow star or point, um, of this metapolitic system is lower than the conservative subsolidus water, which is represented by with this uh, uh, dashed line and which is the one uh, used for the pseudosection. Um, and that at 730 degree, you uh, only produce about 15% uh, of, uh, um, of melt. But by only adding 0 0.33 and are getting up to here, with, at the same temperature, you produce up to 20% of melt. 
So uh, just to keep in mind, but uh, to show how just little water uh, added into the system um, produce a, a consistent amount of melt, uh, which is uh, more, um, which re reflect better the um, pollutants uh, uh, that uh, are um, that intruded the Georgetown in layer. <coughs> Okay, if we look then at the Eastern domain, where basically the, where the, the 1550 D2M2 event is pervasive. So in this case, uh, S2 is a composite high grade um, migmatitic foliation that is actual prana fabric of um, F2 folds, uh, which, um, which are defined by an older differentiated fabric, which is um, obli uh, commonly obliterated during partial melting. S2 is regionally folded by uh, east-west uh, F3 folds, uh, as you can see from the sternet. Nonetheless, the north-south uh, original uh, trend of the S2 foliation is preserved within F3 hinges. Indeed, by unfolding the uh, east-west trending folds within this region indicates that the folded S2 surface was originally north-south striking, which coincide with the enveloping surface of the S2 foliation. Um, also, uh, S2 is associated, like in the central domain, to east and southeast um, mineral, uh, L2 mineral lineation. Um, and in, um, another thing that is important to mention is that both symmetrical and asymmetrical uh, extensional structures, as well as leucocratic uh, material developed parallel uh, to uh, the dominant migmatitic S2 foliation, as you can see, here from these field pictures, suggesting um, a sinistral sense of shear and that melt uh, segregation occurred during the development of S2, um, but also late and post S2. So also in the Eastern domain, we dated the S2 migmatitic fabric, which yielded a date of 1550 million year. And the PT condition recorded uh, by the silimanite and biotite gneisses uh, are um, at a bit at um, about um, eight kilobar and seven hundred and fifty degrees, so um, reflect lower crustal um, lo lower crustal level compared to the fifteen fifty S two foliation in the central domain. If we look, so in in this uh, in this um, in this domain, there are there is there are not like uh, there are not. Um, uh, voluminous granitic sheets or plutons, but uh, there is mainly uh, partial melting, so leucocratic uh, uh, material uh, within the different uh, lithologies. So we dated these uh, leucocratic layers, uh, which also yielded an age of 1550 million years, uh, where you can see also nice peritectic garnets, uh, which is indeed um, uh, showed also by the geochemistry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, not only from uh, the Western granite, but also uh, the Eastern uh, leucocratic layers here in these uh, red dots um, uh, su uh, suggest that um, there was a, gar a garnet retention uh, within those um, melts. Um, uh, something uh, important as well is that the zirconium content in these leucocratic layers is um, also similar to uh, the one from the granites from the Western domain, um, which indeed reflect temperatures, um, similar temperatures, so between 800 and 850 uh, degrees Celsius. However, the main difference between uh, the melts from the Western and the Eastern domain is that the Eastern domain um, temperature are just slightly higher than the host rock, which is represented by these uh, red squares, which are the migmatites that I, showed, I just showed earlier. earlier. Um, on the other hand, the Western domain, they intrude the low-grade phyllitic rocks from the uh, upper crustal Western domain, but show the same um, high uh, magmatic temperature. So if we combine all this information and the multiple PTEDT path, uh, we identify three main uh, metamorphic domains and two, at least two main uh, tectonic units. Um, and in particular, uh, during the D1 and one event uh, at 1600 million years, 
we had the development of this uh, north northeast striking uh, compressional structures um, that uh, developed a dominant S1 fabric, which in the Western domain is recorded at Grinch's fascist conditions, um, so upper crustal levels, and in the central domain are recorded metamphibolite condition uh, and therefore at mid crustal conditions. Um, the overprinting 1550 uh, D2M2 event is a high grade, is a high temperature event that is not only associated with the development of a high-grade foliation S2, but also with the synkinematic intrusion of granitic sheets and in the, in the central domain and, and extensive puncture melting in the, um, at lower crustal level in the central domain. Indeed, as you, as you can see from here, the S2 fabric dated at 1550 million years is recording at mid-crustal level in the central domain and the lower crustal level in the eastern domain. Um, additionally, um, is uh, uh, the, as we mentioned earlier, the S2, uh, the, the D2 structures are extensional structures that were uh, pervasively recorded in the central and the eastern domain, but not in the western domain. And we interpret this dichotomy to reflect the presence of a tectonic uh, uh, contact between the western and the central and eastern domain. Indeed, the progressive development of uh, the two structure during melt segregation associated to uh, extensional structures suggests that this is a zone of high grade uh, ductile um, strain that uh, we interpret to be a uh, um, kilometric thick uh, extensional uh, detachment zone um, that developed during the extensional D2 event. And the uh, we, I will show that later, but you can see how this west dipping, shallow west dipping structure is, um, is not only, um, can on, not only be, can be traced from the surface to deep structural levels. Um, and then we have the last deformation event, which uh, I'm not really uh, concentrating that much during this talk, but uh, is there uh, and is um, post 15, 50 million years and is reflected by this east-west uh, um, um, D3, uh, D3 structures, which uh, reorient most of the previous fabrics and the previous structures, uh, and is generally a, a, retrograde, um, a retrograde event uh, that we interpreted as uh, the final exhumation of the, um, of the different tectonometamorphic units, uh, which occurred uh, at Grinch's patches in the central domain, but at uh, uh, lower upper amphibolite fatches in the central and in the eastern domain. So, um, yeah, we can move on to the last bits. Uh, so if we go back to um, uh, an image that I showed at the beginning, and in particular the regional uh, pictures and how the Georgetown in Lyre and the Montausit Lyre um, were suggested to um, collided 1.60 billion years. I, sh I, I, I put then here, uh, so we, we have to, to just do a step back. Um, and, and for this reason, I put also these uh, uh, MTI maps where uh, there is the Georgetown in Lyre and the Montaise in Lyre and, um, and also the um, suture zone that were uh, hypothesized, hypothesized, I think, um, between these two uh, in Lyre's. So uh, to evaluate uh, whether uh, the, the location and, uh, and the, the evolution of this uh, uh, Precambrian crust, um, we um, corroborated all our, um, all our data with additional lutetium hafnium in zircon and samarinodymium uh, in monazite uh, within um, granites from the, the Georgetown in Lyre between the Georgetown and the Montaisen Lyre and uh, the Eastern uh, Montaisen Lyre. So we just looked at the perluminous S-type granites from the, uh, from the Georgetown in Lyre, uh, but west of it, uh, progressively more abundant uh, A and I-type 
uh, granites in blue and pink, respectively, intruded at 1.54, um, the A, the I, and the A-type granites between 1.55 and 1.49 billion years. So, as you can see from the from the hafnium in zircon uh, um, in a um, east-west uh, transect. Um, the Hafnium shows uh, a progressively uh, more positive uh, values uh, going from the S-type to the A-type granites. And also the Samarian Eudemium in monazite um, uh, showed from uh, an increase to more, more positive values from the S-type granites in the Georgetown in layer to the A-type granites in the Eastern Monazite in layer. Um, so for this reason, um, and because um, we um, uh, we haven't really identified any uh, any major uh, major um, uh, crustal scale suture, let's say west of the Georgetown in layer, um, we suggest that the suture could be further west. But if we have a look at the um, seismic profile, which goes from um, east. To west here in the Georgetown in layer by uh, highlighted by this dotted line, which is uh, here east to west, and then from the Georgetown in layer down to the Montaiza in layer up here from the northeast to the southwest. And um, so we reviewed this uh, this, this uh, deep seismic profile that was previously published. In particular, we focus on um, the character of this uh, extension of 1550 detachment folds that uh, we mapped in the surface to be um, uh, extensional and synchinematic with all the granitic sheets. And you can follow it to the west down till to the Moho, um, which goes down to um, between the, the Georgetown in Lyre, which is here, and the Montaza in Lyre. Um, so this structure here is the is one is the one that was in previously interpreted to be the suture, which is this one here. However, we were interpreted to be this uh, extensional detachment fault system dated at 1550 million years. So we had to look for the suture further west, further west uh, in Morg, and um, and that's where we suggest that um, this uh, um, north north south striking uh, crustal scale. Uh, structure, uh, crustal scale structure um, could be uh, the suture uh, between these two in layers. And, um, <clears throat> and so we suggest that basically east of this uh, northeast, uh, north uh, south structure um, is uh, up to the Tasman line, which is runs some, some, somewhere here, um, is considered as part of Laurentia. Um, and we therefore regarded this, this, this suture, which is called the Gigius suture, as the um, 16, uh, 1.6 billion years um, Nuna suture. So in this, um, in this sketch, we are at the end. <laughs> I hope you're still alive. Um, so I'm just, uh, so this is a um, tectonic sketch that combines uh, the magmatic, metamorphic, and structural uh, results that uh, um, we put together uh, from this uh, field, field based study. And we um, combined with um, published work uh, and the seismic profile that I just show you. And uh, we compared um, different uh, uh, tectonic mechanisms and processes that could that uh, occur in active collisional and accretionary origins such as the Himalayas or the Aegean or, or, or origin uh, and suggest that the 15 the 6 the 1.6 billion years uh, origin in northeast australia could be explained with a hybrid tectonic model characterized by a combination of different elements um, so if we have a look at them so we have uh, so the first stage is the, the collisional stage between North, uh, the North Australian Craton uh, here in, uh, on the left and um, the Laurentian block. That occurred at 1.6 billion years, as we, uh, have, as we have said, and is uh, um, uh, where, where all the D, compressional D1 structure formed at upper crustal level here by the green stars 
and um, at mid-crustal level uh, in the current sterilite stability field. Um, so, and additionally, the, uh, the seismic profile um, shows um, in the eastern part the deep uh, top to the east reverse folds that are consistent with uh, thin skin accretion during um, westward underplating of the Laurentian uh, plate. Um, and um, in the Montaizane layer in the western part of the seismic uh, west verging reverse fold are consistent with uh, the scene metamorphic uh, back thrusting in the overriding North uh, Australian plate. So during the 1590, 1570 uh, million years, um, we interpret as an interval of progressive boreal and uh, final stages of the collisional phase. And at this stage, um, the slab pool uh, force uh, um, was inhibited by continental fragments jamming the subduction channel uh, and starting to neck uh, the, the slab um, then to uh, end, um, ending up into break off of the slab, um, which um, triggered um, isostatic rebound and um, the development of uh, the detachment, the extensional detachment fold that um, the extensional detachment fold that um, uh, here in the in the in the Georgetown uh, in Lyre uh, during um, yeah during this extensional rebound um, after slab break cough, however, and the isostatic rebound. Uh, the decoupling of the upper crustal layers um, trickled, triggered also uh, a stenospheric infilling, uh, which kind of bring us here, and consequently opening of the mantle wedge uh, during the steepening of the slab, uh, of the denser slab, and uh, a sort of um, uh, slab rollback, if you, if you want. Um, so this post-collisional uh, during the, the formation of this uh, um, of this wedge and the, this detachment falls, uh, we have the um, extensional uh, syn kinematic granites uh, that um, intrudes uh, together with the development of the D2 structures, um, which coincide with the uh, high temperature um, as to the development of the high temperature as to foliation. Um, so in this scenario, uh, fluids income from the uh, astenospheric wedge uh, here that produced uh, water flux melting of the above sedimentary thickened crust of uh, the lower plate, generating the S-type granites, uh, the low temperature S-type granites uh, from the uh, from the Georgetown in layer. Um, the increase in a, uh, in abundance in abundance of uh, hotter uh, uh, A and uh, I and A type granites uh, westward from the GTI, from the Georgetown in Lyre, uh, reflected continuous uh, lithospheric thinning, loss of supracrustal component, and additional femic or mantle uh, pulses, uh, magma derived pulses, um, generating hotter and drier intrusions um, in what is now the upper plate. So by 1500 million years, uh, the erogeny has stabilized. And therefore, the continental collision uh, between Australia and Laurentia Bock built uh, a broad scale orogenic belt, where the structural metamorphic and magmatic records associated with the 1600 million years final assembly of Nuna were extending um, for uh, hundreds of kilometers across the track. And that is all. Thanks for your attention. Actually, that is not all. I have a uh, Small surprise. All right. I am sure that um, I hope that uh, um, a lot of you are already heavy listeners of the Nice Chat podcast. But uh, if you haven't listened to it yet, uh, and if you like to learn new things uh, in all fields of geosciences, and if you have a soft spot for shenanigans, tune in and listen to the Nice Chat podcast. Thanks for your attention.
And now that's it, that is all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. Very impressive, impressive uh, work that you have done. Thank for you. Your PhD. Really nice. Thank you very much. Um, let me just um, add one sec because um, I can't. Yeah, your sound is a bit uh, low. Oh, you can't hear me. Good. Yeah, now it's fine. Now, yeah. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, okay, let me just. Uh, um, yeah. Oh, why doesn't show me the? That that's fine. That's fine. It's okay. Yeah. 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 It's really impressive how how large was your area and how much work yeah. have you done from field to to micro scale. It's really nice. And yeah. uh, we have few questions, and we also invite uh, people from audience to send their questions to you. Or later also, if uh, they want to send to yourself directly. For and, sure, for uh, sure. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, so I will start <laughs> because I keep them like uh, waiting for for the moment. So yeah. Sylvia, I was, I was uh, with a special uh, eye watching your talk. Uh, because you have applied several uh, Zikon thermometers and also for monazite, and uh, we know that uh, they are quite controversial. Uh, so the use of some of them, and there are some restrictions. I was wondering if you can, I mean, also because there are several uh, people that watch that are uh, developing their studies, and I, I also um, have discussed that a lot with uh, Brenda and Marco. Uh, What's your opinion about them, your work, and uh, what can you tell us about uh, the, the use of this? So, um, yeah, I, I guess it's, I mean, it's, a, it's a hot topic. There are a lot of publications coming out and um, um, of people applying or using actually the method in different ways. Um, what, um, so what I, what I think is certainly is that um, um, the, the use of the only thermometer itself can be controversial, and uh, for this reason, like I, I, I have tried many different things, and as you can see here, I, I didn't go into details, but mm -hmm. um, uh, there are some works from um, from fingers and and these these people that uh, um, they say that um, uh, a lower activity should be used for. Um, for the <clears throat> um, titanium in zircon mm -hmm. thermometry, for example, um, or um, and 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 I mean, there is there is not really a brief a brief answer to that. Mm -hmm. But I think like the main strength uh, of this work was that uh, we combined and kind of like tackled uh, the. Um, what we wanted to know, which was actually uh, the temperature of this granite, uh, by uh, by from from different uh, from different um, aspects, let's say. Um, but something that uh, I thought was uh, quite striking and quite interesting is that uh, both uh, titanium in zircon, zircon saturation temperature, and monazite type of saturation temperature gave um, quite uh, um, consistent results in terms of ranges obviously mm -hmm. um, for uh, for for the granites from the central domain compared to the one from the western and the eastern domain um, and and that, and that was also consistent with um, with um, so, so the fact that these granites are synkinematic to the mm -hmm. structures of our host rock uh, that uh, we have dated as well and we have constraints in PT um, that was, uh, um, I think, one of the main strain, let's say, to put some uh, uh, barriers to, uh, to what uh, the thermometers uh, were giving as a result. To constrain better applying yeah. other stuff together, because I think that's yeah. also I, a main point from petrochronology that we try to, to reach uh, the, the, the result from several uh, paths, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely, for sure. And I think that's, uh, 
I mean, that's a great point. It's something that has to be um, always uh, strengthened, I think. Um, and um, I mean, I go in, 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 in detail of this work in, 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 in the paper that was published last year in uh, Contribution to Mineralogy and Petrology. But I think that's also something that uh, you mentioned as well, this, uh, for, for example, combining also the modeling and the geochemistry and the fact that you combine, uh, you look at the geochemistry of these granites and then you model, um, you compare it to them to the melt and the solid phases uh, of um, um, of the ever average met metapolitic rocks. Um, uh, also, uh, was 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 actually something that we didn't do at the beginning. We did after just just afterwards uh, in a, in the second stage of this work, and uh, was quite striking how um, the um, the melt that we obtained were actually in agreement with um, the, the granites from the Ace area. But um, so I know I didn't really answer your question. No, <laughs> but, but uh, I mean, that's, I mean that's, yeah, that's, the point is, is, is no really is striking. Yeah, 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 yeah no, exactly. Yeah. Like the point is really like trying to, you know, constrain um, whatever is the question you want to answer and whatever uh, work you're doing, but it's trying to constrain, I think, um, as you said, like trying to, you know, find different ways, um, um, different ways and different uh, disciplines that actually verge to the same to the same goal, which is understanding, for instance, the petrogenesis of this uh, magmatic system or or something like that. But using just, uh, um, I don't know, titanium in zircon and then to, to understand uh, the temperature of a granite is, uh, I think, uh, I mean, is, is a bit, uh, can be very controversial. Yeah, I think it's, it, for me, it's exactly my opinion that uh, the thing is that, uh, as you said, you have like some consistency for your data from different data and it was pretty much to, to raise this discussion. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. And, and, and I mean, something that uh, I didn't go into detail, but also the, the fact that we dated, um, we dated the S2 foliation that, um, uh, uh, that at the beginning we, uh, we, we had like quite a, quite a, of a spread within the ages. And I was trying to understand like, okay, so what is it? Because it makes a difference whether it's like 1550 or, you know, 1500 million years or something. But uh, because like the grinds are synchronomatic to the development of the S2 foliation, um, which are all 1550, uh, and then you know you have um, um, yeah, and, and so on, the, and therefore like combining the structure with uh, the, uh, the magmatic and the metamorphic radar re record really uh, kind of like pinpoint some um, some of the answer we were looking for. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing that you have investigated so many uh, yeah. objects. <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah, yeah. Well, you go with the question. <laughs> <laughs> I will come back for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Silvia, firstly, uh, thank you for this very nice talk. And I, I have not a, a really exactly a, a question. It's more a curiosity. Mm -hmm. The uh, granite grains are zoned, right? How was the dating process and how avoid these uh, compositional domains interference or mixing to obtain these ages? Yeah, for the location uh, half new dates, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, so basically, um, what we found is that uh, um, uh, basically, the so we had sterilite and garnet, uh, um, sterilite and garnet uh, schist uh, that were the are this one in this uh, in the low strain domains in the D two low strain domains, and those are the one that we targeted. Um, only this one was uh, well, this one and another one. Um, Showed this uh, this zoning, but um, was not. Uh, I actually I'm not sure if I have any picture. It was was not a really distinct zoning. Um, 
I did compositional maps. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't actually. I didn't put any picture and any back slides here from uh, on that. Um, but uh, um, uh, I think only one uh, of the um, only one garnet uh, that was uh, where were pretty big garnets and uh, actually didn't have any zoning but were full of inclusion was uh, was one of the garnets that we had to repeat. Uh, but as as far as um, I remember because I didn't do myself the Mutishim Hafnium Geochronology, but was sent to the lab. But as far as um, as I remember with uh, this one here in the Starlight and Garnet uh, samples, they, were, they weren't issue for, um, uh, for, for, for like considering the zoning uh, of the Garnet. And they actually gave a, quite a good spread, which, uh, um, allowed to have quite a good age. Um, and actually even this one, um, the, so you see like, for instance, here is uh, where the composition was a bit uh, more uh, reset, let's say. Um, the, um, the spread was a bit less uh, than here, but, um, but because um, they, this, these garnets are, uh we think based on the modeling that we did um are actually grew in a pretty in a relatively uh fast time let's say um and therefore there it didn't really you know create uh, uh i don't know this like 30 million years gap between the core and the rim that could like affect the ages um i think that 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 would be my answer Okay, thanks. We have another question here for Dino. I put here for us. <laughs> yes, we, we, we really nice work. Why controversy between Nuna and Columbia names, Silvia? <laughs> sorry, sorry, say that again. I put here the question, look, uh, Gina I can asked, see it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Gina asked, why the controversy between Nuna and Columbia names? Oh, I see, I see. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm just waiting, just gonna do, um, I wanna put this, uh, I'm just gonna put it like that so that I can see, okay? Can you see the slide? Ah, I put here. Uh, okay. okay, so uh, actually, so basically this one is actually um, a recent paper uh, that was published in geology by uh, Wang Kenna and co-authors. Um, and uh, where basically they differentiate, they, they, they differentiate between uh, mega continent and supercontinent. Uh, and and where they use like the um, they use the word the, the name mega continent for Nuna and supercontinent for Columbia, saying that the mega continent is just preceding the formation of the supercontinent. Uh, this is like the way these authors um, use the, this uh, you know all these um, uh, these two names that are used for different uh, for different uh, super supercontinents, for example, Gondwana and Pangaea that are here, right? Um, so these uh, these authors interpreted Gondwana to precede the formation of the Pangaea supercontinent. Um, this is how this author um, interpreted that. That being said, is um, uh, I think that um, I, I just uh, I just I just recently submitted a paper um, just uh, mentioning Nuna, and I was told that I had to include also the name Columbia in in bracket, which is kind of like um, uh, how do you say like um, you also in Brazil have like uh, I don't know Pan African or another you know like a synonym or I don't, maybe it's an old way or you know just different, um, different names for eventually probably the same supercontinent. Um, I always use Nuna just um, 
just because uh, not 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 for a reason to be honest. But I know that some people get upset. That's why I put Nuna slash Columbia. <laughs> I see. There are several people congratulating you, Sylvia. Thank for, you. For Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, mm, yeah, there are some other questions as well. And uh, Sylvia, I don't know if I missed that, uh, but uh, have you talked about the inclusions that you have in Gamut? What are the minerals? Um, no, I haven't. Um, so uh, there are mainly um, like there is some biotite. Um, there are no zircons because uh, like there are no zircons in this rock. That's why we uh, dated them with monazites. Um, uh, th there are few monazites. Um, the, the, the monazites are mainly in, in, uh, in the surroundings. Um, Quartz, ilmenite, uh, yeah, these are the main the main inclusions. Yeah, I was just curious to to know if also uh, something else to try to apply it would be like a thermoraman barometry, something like that. Uh, uh, such as quartz inclusions, like for uh, quartz inclusions, or if there were monazite inclusions that uh, you could date it. But you mainly dated uh, monazite with the um, shrimp, right? So, so the monazite I dated uh, with um, split stream for the metamorphic monazite. Mm -hmm. And then we did, um, because we was giving this uh, range uh, mm -hmm. in, with the split stream, so I, want, I, I really wanted to understand that whether it was the 1550 event or not. So then when we did the work on the magmatic, uh, on, on the granites, then we did monazite and zircon on the shrimp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's the link for, for the other question. <laughs> Uh, we have a, another question I, I put here, and Brenda asks. <laughs> Brenda, we have uh, a question from a uh, big fan. <laughs> so a question from Vitor Barrotti. Uh, how important was the choice of technique for determining the age of the granites? And did you get similar results from the laser? Why did you do shrink? <laughs> yeah, tricky one. Uh, now that's very interesting because um, we actually started to date the granites with the laser, um, and um, I think we started to do split stream, and then and then we just did some ages. But um, there was uh, some problem somewhere uh, uranium rich, so um, so it was. Uh, was uh, always tripping, uh, and then um, and then they still gave like quite a range in terms of ages for what we really wanted to to uh, to to know. Um, so uh, and this is the reason why, as I was I was mentioning earlier, then we decided to go for the shrimp because uh, we really wanted to uh, understand. Um, not only uh, yeah the age of this high temperature event, and also because it's like it's high grade. Um, so obviously it's not ultra high temperature, but it's still high grade. And so because as I meant, as I briefly mentioned before, there is the D three event, which is still like an event where you have a lot of hydrothermal fluids, uh, you know, of the last uh, uh, of uh, of the um, you know post granite intrusions basically. And so it was really important to understand the actual age of this high temperature event and this synclimatic intrusions. And thankfully enough, uh, I had the opportunity to have to, well, to have the shrimp in, in house because I was at Curtin, which is uh, amazing for the facilities that they have. Um, and uh, and it was, it was uh, crucial to have that because uh, we also, uh, the other thing is that you know, as I, I kind of went through the domains, but they are upper, uh, middle, and lower crustal domains. So it's a crustal section, 
and you have this, the a magmatic system that is is uh, partially melting the lower crust and then it's intruding up to um, extrusion of the volcanic rocks in the west. So it's a, a synchronous uh, magmatic system. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Okay, I will, uh, yeah, following Victor and Marco and Maira's uh, questions, I would like to, because you are talking about the dating techniques, so uh, we would like to know a little bit more detail. So you were um, saying that you did uh, uh, split stream before the shrink. So I was interested if you had some uh, trace element data from monazite. And uh, yeah, because you had like a very beautiful sketches, you know, from uh, all the different stages, from different uh, foliation stages. And if you had, Maida was asking, what were the um, uh, inclusion trails in Garnet? And uh, I was wondering if you had oh, yeah. some sort of uh, uh, monazite inclusion trails in, in this Garnet, you know, inclusions. Yeah. Uh, and how do you correlate, you know, this um, collisional stage? Uh, how how did you constrain this event? I mean, was based on, you know, did you correlate the monazite ages in different chemical domains or was based on test row setting? I mean, monazite inclusions in garnet and then uh, followed by matrix uh, related yeah. monazite. And then if you had these um, um, trace element data from monazite, because yeah. later on you predicted on your uh, thermodynamic modeling that you had some uh, important input of fluids which uh, ended up with uh, like a higher amounts of melts in the uh, second event. And if that reflects in a different composition of monazite, I mean, not only composition, but also in a different age range, you know, comparing yeah. to the previous event. Yeah, okay. These are a lot of things. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, let me see. Um, let me see. So I would start probably uh, with this one. Um, so basically, um, can you see? Can you see this the slide? Yes. 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 Mm. Okay. Um, so basically, uh, as you can see, so well, so the inclusion are mainly quartz, right? Um, so when, once we uh, so we dated the garnets because we could constrain the garnets microstructurally and um, and also um, petrologically. So they uh, are associated with the starlight in the in the in the stability field, right? And um, let me see if I have yeah I have actually this one. You see, so basically we constrain, so this is uh, the garnet that uh, um, that basically has uh, to answer, well, for yeah, instance, yes, actually, I didn't show that to Marco. Just a minute, can you, can you make it like a presentation mode so we can see it uh, like? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so, um, yeah, so for instance, here you can see that um, this garnet, which is the one that I showed before, um, actually has this uh, um, <clears throat> uh, zoning and uh, uh, basically reflect the growth uh, from uh, um, six kilobar roughly to uh, up to nine kilobar. Okay. Um, and um, whereas this one, for instance, uh, do, uh, doesn't. Uh, doesn't really show that, but uh, it just showed this, this later event. But, but the point is that um, we, uh, we then try to find monazites within these garnet and starlight samples. But that was uh, quite tricky, to be honest, because uh, they didn't really have uh, a lot. They are um, about 630 degree. Um, so uh, although um, although people find monazites and, and we actually find them as well, but not that many. 
And for this reason, um, the constraint on the monazite on the 1600 event um, was not that great. And that's what I showed here. Yeah, you see like the dates that we actually have from the monazites for the 1600 event are, uh, are just a few. Um, but they still like they still corroborated the 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 garnet ages, which is uh, which is important, uh, I think. Um, and then uh, and then something that uh, I think is uh, uh, very important and really um, really helped, I think, putting together all the pieces is uh, especially when you are in the field, which is. Uh, very very deep very easy to get uh, to get lost especially when you have like one outcrop here another one two kilometers away or something but what is what was really important was not only to track the structures but to track also the mineral assemblages that define the structures that was that was really really important um, because uh, uh, only in this way uh, we actually managed to find these uh, relics, which are very rare to find, um, because um, well, because first of all, you need to have the obviously the right outcrop, um, and you need to go in this uh, low strain domain, as I mentioned earlier, and that's where you can find the uh, previous uh, history that is uh, that is preserved, because uh, in the central domain, in the eastern domain. This, this uh, high temperature event is, is, is very pervasive, so um, uh, it's not easy to find relics. Um, okay, I am not lost. I remember the traces. Let me see if I put the traces somewhere. Yeah, it's really challenging to um, yeah get datable monazite in green schist yeah. and over amphibolite yeah. faces yeah that's why i was kind of curious you know because i know this is a lot of work and uh you did like in, in very uh detailed and uh yeah and maybe I, I kind of you know missed some of these uh trace element information that you got from split stream for example and then yeah. you ended up with the shrink dating yeah actually um the so I have to say that I did split yeah I obviously did the split stream but the um, because I, I I only got that one monazite that gave me uh, usable data for uh, the sixteen hundred event uh, that's basically the only one that uh, um, was slightly different from uh, this one that are stable in this uh, uh, during the high temperature event uh, because that monazite is. Um, uh, is a stable when the garnet is stable, mm -hmm. whereas here the garnet breaks down during this event, and uh, you you have it rel relict, but uh, is um, but it's not stable anymore during this uh, high temperature event. Um, yeah, I noticed that you got like some uh, high yttrium uh, cores. You got like a very nice um, yeah. progressive zoning in your garnets, either from major and trace elements. Really yeah. nice. Yeah, 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 exactly. That was great. And uh, even this one, you see that uh, is a bit uh, a bit more weird. So the as you can see, the, the trace, the major here are a bit are flatter than, than this one, obviously. But mm -hmm. the traces, they still preserve like, um, you know, uh, this um, higher lutetium and yttrium in the in the core. Uh, yeah. But is, uh, is I think that is just like mainly the cut as well of the garnet that you see is uh, is not symmetric as this one, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, but but you yeah, this one you can also see from the microstructures that um, preserve this uh, you know uh, initial uh, initial fabric in the core. Um, man, I I'm actually not sure that uh, I put. Um, the traces, but something uh, I think also this one is interesting because uh, although it's a garnet relict within this uh, sylvanite foliation, uh, the 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 chemistry of the garnet still plots in the sterilite and garnet stability field. Although 
the the rock model is actually the garnet silica the the this, this this stability field here where the garnet is breaking down and is basically um, almost to zero. Uh, and then yeah yeah I, I actually don't have them I, I I don't know why I didn't put them. Um, I'm sure I'm sure they they are in uh, they are in the paper but. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, I forgot to add them here. I was sure they were, but uh, maybe, maybe I, I delete them. I don't know. Um, but um, uh, but in the um, for the for when we for the um, for the granites, we I didn't uh, I didn't do traces. Uh, we did the split stream at uh, with a colleague of mine that he did hafnium and. Uh, uh, and and that's and the hafnium that I show you here, um, that is in. Um, let me see. Yeah, it's an in situ um, split stream. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. Yeah. Go ahead. No, I thank just, you, Sylvia. Yeah, thank you. I just thought uh, you were finished, but uh, you can con conclude. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I'm. Uh, I, I'm. I mean, I'm not sure if I answer all the um, little bits. Uh, so no, it's I, totally I have another fine. question for you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, knowing that, uh, because I thought really interesting that you really connected, like. Uh, from field work to sync section, micro scale, and then you came back for geodynamic models and combined it uh, with the geophysics. That was super nice. And uh, I was wondering if, uh, does your model have any implications for economic geology in the area? Because it's um, really connected to Monte Isa? Isa, I don't know how to pronounce Monte Isa, yeah, Isa. yeah, yeah. And uh, and I know also that uh, talking to you and Bruno and people living in Australia that uh, this is a, a great focus also for university for research and uh, and I think it's also really important for us in Brazil especially nowadays to make these connections between um, basic science and yeah I was wondering if you if you have some correlation in this scenario yeah so for sure there is. Uh... Uh, there, there, there are uh, implications for that. I was um, um, <clears throat> there, there are many companies that are working um, in the in this area, basically uh, western in the western part of the Georgetown, and uh, um, and I mean, yeah, Montes. I mean, every, is, there are world class deposits, um, and and the main the main implication are. Um, I think they are mainly um, associated or correlated to the extensional event, um, which which uh, which which develops these uh, uh, crustal scale structures that are actually channels along which uh, fluids and uh, melts um, uh, can um, can just like. Um, travel. And yeah, just travel uh, up uh, up to to the upper crustal levels, and and and, and, and I mean in the, in this area, for instance, uh, uh, most of the anomalies that have been identified, and and that's how also um, we um, we let's say uh, in in uh, we. Uh, interpret these uh, the Western granites that have this uh, lighter, this uh, higher temperature compared to the uh, granites from the central domain, because of this uh, um, and, and where you know uh, I've shown the pictures where they, there are um, <coughs> um, mafic uh, mafic uh, enclaves within um, within these granites, and and uh, we interpret it to be you know the, just mafic uh, pulses. Um, uh, going, you know, up to the uh, up to the crust through these uh, uh, channels, you know, um, and uh, and so um, I, I I think that uh, most of the the the, the, the deposits that these uh, that they, they are targeting are actually uh, um, 
associated to uh, these major structures. And uh, we have also published a paper actually this year uh, that is in Gondwana Research where um, uh, <clears throat> where some we did some um, uh, argon argon um, uh, geochronology, but uh, but where basically we um, we say that these structures that are actually the proterozoic structure are the one that um, where fluids are then remobilized and and uh, and this um, and this uh, and, and 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 you know this um, or deposits then are formed basically. So and, and I'm sure I, I I think there is like a lot a lot of potential, especially you know once uh, you know once all these uh, different uh, uh, aspects are actually combined in order to understand whether you know there are more um, or deposits or uh, that haven't been found yet in the area. Also because. Uh, well, the accessibility is, is another big problem in the area, right? So uh, I, I, I was, I mean, was lucky compared to what is between Georgetown and Mona Isa. Georgetown is a paradise <laughs> because then uh, west of it uh, is uh, is just drilling. So obviously, you need to know when, where then to drill. Yeah, it's super interesting that you have several implications, even for economic geology coming from Paleoproterozoic. Yeah. 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 And, and Silvia, we also like to ask, uh, also to Brenda, to Brenda and uh, other people, uh, if you can tell a bit how it was uh, developing this this work, uh, a bit about the challenges and the rewards as well. It's also stimulating uh, other people that are holding their their own research. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, it was very challenging, and um, and I mean, you know, it was um, obviously uh, it never goes like the way you want, right? So uh, it was very challenging, also because I was uh, coming from um, uh, you know mapping uh, uh, mapping the Alps, uh, uh, doing a ten um, k map, so. Um, going to have to map uh, a terrain such the Georgetown in Lyre. Uh, I, I, I mean, I have to say, obviously, it was a bit lost at the beginning, um, and then, and then, you know, uh, understanding also, uh, well, also how to do field work in Australia. That's also a challenge, but is exciting. Um, but uh, yeah, basically, we had two major field work campaign. And um, and what was crucial though was to try to understand uh, try to understand as much as possible in the first fieldwork campaign and try to um, uh, try to tar to have some targets between one campaign and the other one in order so that in the second campaign you could actually go in specific targeted uh, area and test the results that you got in the past year, you know? Um, and um, I, I actually, at the beginning of, of the project, I, I, I started in my mind with uh, this uh, multidisciplinary method, which uh, was uh, taught uh, to me uh, by the, the department where I come from, which is the department from Milano. Um, where um, I think they did a very good job, at, they do a very good job at putting together um, the microstructural and the structural uh, skills to, uh, or disciplines together with uh, understanding the relation with the minerals. And so really like merging together the structural and the metamorphic uh, um, uh, studies uh, or disciplines. Um, and then, um, and then on top of that, though, um, for instance, the magmatic study is something, or the, the study of the petrogenesis of these uh, igneous uh, uh, rocks was something that was not really in my plan, um, but it turns out to be um, essential and and kind of like part of the story, you know, uh, because. Uh, uh, because that's part of this D2M2 1550 event. And so it uh, was, uh, was challenging also, you know, 
getting into these new fields, the fields of uh, geochronology, geochemistry, that was not really uh, something uh, I, 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 I did during my bachelor or master projects. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, and, and something that uh, it really helped me, uh, helped me a lot uh, is um, the fact that I was part of like a very multidisciplinary group where there were researchers that, uh, uh, you know, were in different, uh, different steps of their career. So I had uh, my mates uh, that were doing my PhD with me, the, the PhD with me, uh, studying uh, other aspects of this, uh, of, this stu- of this area. And then there were other postdocs or other professors um, that were always giving me different uh, uh, input on, um, or, you know, just discussing with them was giving uh, different ideas or different way um, to, for instance, uh, tackle a problem or um, such as, for instance, the geochronology uh, that uh, was not really my field that really smashed my, uh, crushed my, my head so much to understand uh, uh, the error, the propagated error and what was actually the age of this, uh, of this high temperature foliation and uh, and so it really, uh, it really, I think that the, the whole, um, you know, uh, the whole surroundings and, uh, and the environment I was in uh, has been uh, very supportive and crucial to also the succeed of the, of the project because, uh, uh, because, you know, like eventually you, I mean, eventually you need to, um, finish your 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 PhD and your project with some successful results or 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 anyway some sorts of results. But the fact that I could also uh, you know come come out with some good publication that was uh, I mean I was pretty pretty um, happy of that. Um, but yeah, definitely like let's say that uh, I brought I brought with me like the method or the approach. And then when I was there, I just kept on like uh, bringing into what I like my, my little, uh, you know, network, some more disciplines that I, that were really um, uh, key to actually answer a lot of questions. Uh, and so by then combining them all, uh, yeah, that was, uh, was really important. Yeah, that's super nice, Sylvia. Yeah. How important it's uh, to have the group and the group meetings. Sure. It's also why we want to discuss together and for sure collaborate. Thank you for sharing with us your experience as well. Yeah, yeah. No worries, no worries. It's important because, like, you know, our stuff that, uh, I mean, is also difficult to hear or, you know, to, um, yeah, to know how then... Uh, things really goes or because i mean there are not everywhere you have uh, a multidisciplinary group uh, that uh, you meet uh, you meet every week with them and you have like uh, you are like 30 or 20 researchers that uh, from different uh, aspects like from uh, paleomagnetist to uh, the petrologist to the geochronologist to the geodynamicist and so um, and so i think that w- that was really a plus really um, that uh, I think uh, was very special and uh, and uh, and not very common, I would say. But it's, uh, it's definitely good, and I I am actually very glad that uh, uh, Petrochronics uh, th- that you had the idea to um, to you guys to build up this uh, this group together, and that's why I was uh, super keen to join since the beginning because it's uh, it's just good to share and uh, you know to know it. Uh, uh, everyone's experiences and uh, and uh, you know to learn from them and um, and so yeah that's that's very important yeah i hope we can manage to have some uh, meeting to really get to know each other personally <laughs> for sure. i <laughs> hope so possible. soon yeah 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 for sure for sure so i guess marco has some last question for you before yeah. you get too tired. <laughs> <laughs> it's a curiosity. And so the, 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 those mask rocks within uh, the in Lyra's domains show any evidence of melting? And if yes, what are they? 
Sorry, which which one? The the Mavic Rocks uh, with oh. the in layers. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's melting. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question because uh, nothing against the Mavics, but I didn't really uh, focus on the, on those during this talk. But yeah, we looked also at Mafix, actually very important because uh, we combined uh, then the Mafix uh, with the metapolitic rocks. And uh, so I show you at the beginning, um, yeah, here. So basically these are the Mafix uh, that, uh, um, that you find in the, in the layer. And let me show you. Uh, So the matrix you mean the amphibolites, right? Okay. Can you can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for example, um, these are uh, amphibolitic rocks from the central domain, um, and here you can see uh, uh, the. Um, the, the thing section and the sketch and also this one was dated. So this one was the one that uh, had more um, in inclusion, let's say, to going back to the inclusion. Um, but in this, uh, this one from the central domain, uh, they uh, are not melted. And this is because this one are actually in the um, in a D2 loss strain domain where uh, you have the garnet that is actually a 1600 million years garnet, but is wrapped by uh, the S2 foliation. Okay. Um, but then if you go, um, let me see here. Yeah. So if you go here or instead in the Eastern domain, um, which are basically all these, uh, um, so these are the amphibole uh, from the Eastern domain this uh, round and, uh, and the square. So these one are melted. As I said, the Eastern domain is, uh, is a migmatitic complex. So there are mainly uh, paragonized, so which are the, met the, yeah, the metapolitic rocks, but then uh, they're intercalated with, um, with amphibolite as well. Uh, and in this case, they are, um, the, so they are melted. And uh, you can see that uh, in the field, um, I think that actually, um, I put that in the, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, no, you can't, no. Yeah, I didn't put a, a field picture of that in the, in the talk. But, um, but yeah, they are melted in the field and also in the, in the theme section, there are these uh, little uh, leucocratic layers um, and um, they, uh, so on these ones, for instance, we did some, um, um, I, I also tried to use some um, uh, geothermal barometry, uh, but uh, it, it didn't really work. Uh, so then basically, um, as you can see, the, uh, the amphibole are, are, are zoned. And so um, basically we, uh, we, just, we just constrained the earlier amphibole and, uh, and like a secondary uh, uh, a secondary amphibole um, uh, with the composition, um, but um, but yeah, and 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 this 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 um, this amphibole like here are intercalated in the field with these uh, paragonites, which are um, the uh, yeah the metapolitic rocks uh, from which we dated the the, the monazite in the restitic and the locratic layers. So yes, they, there are, and in the um, Eastern domain, they have uh, the same, um, uh, roughly the same uh, um, condition, let's say, of the, of the petapolitic rocks, although they show slightly higher um, temperature. Yeah. Oh, very nice, very, very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. So thank you, Sylvia, again for this great talk and joining us today for this great discussion as well. And uh, I would like also to thank uh, Brenda for joining us today for the Petrochronics team and Marco, Mariana, and also people that are in the backstage, Cristina, 
Hugo and Lucas, and um, we will invite you soon for, for our next PTT talk that we already know that will be uh, with the Vito, Dr. Vito Barrotti. And uh, so thank you again and have a nice evening for you. It's already <laughs> very late. And so thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for, uh, for inviting me. It has been a pleasure. And um, yeah, it's great. It's great. So yeah, let's keep it up with this PTT talk. Huh? They're okay. awesome. Yeah. Thank you to, thanks to everyone. And it uh, was a pleasure to meet the crew, actually, because it was the first time for me. Yeah, so. we, we definitely have to, to organize this event. Yeah, this yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so see you next month then. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sylvia. That was really nice. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs>